Good morning or good afternoon to those in Europe who have joined today or those in North America and the Latin America. And also um, maybe good evening to those committed folks who decided to join us from Asia. Um, thank you everyone for being here for our session on telco strategies in edge computing and private networks. Uh, my name is Yasmin and I will be moderating today's session. First, before we jump in, I'll just cover a few housekeeping items. Just to note that everyone is in listen-only mode, um, but if you are having issues with audio, please leave a comment in the questions tab or the chat tab, and one of our team members will assist you. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to submit in any questions for our presenters throughout the session, um, also using the questions tab. And for everyone who has registered for the session, you'll be receiving the webinar slides and recording shortly after to watch back and to share with colleagues. And if you are active on social media, please feel free to tweet us at, uh, at, at STL Partners and hashtag STL Think. So uh, just to get started, we have got a great lineup for today's session. Uh, first, we have my colleague Dahlia Adib, who will be presenting, uh, doing a short presentation on some of our research and insights on this topic. And Dahlia leads our edge computing practice here at STL, so you're in very good hands. And then um, for the rest of the session, we will have a live panel session, and we've got a great lineup uh, for some of the faces that you see here. And um, I will let them introduce themselves um, a little bit later, but without further ado, I will hand it over to Dahlia. Thanks, Yasmin, and hi, everyone. Welcome to the session today. So uh, some of you may have joined our webinar a couple of weeks ago, which was also supported by our partners at Red Hat. Um, this webinar today uh, leverages the same research uh, survey that we, we went through last time. Uh, just as a reminder for those who don't know, uh, we ran a, a survey um, in between December and March of this year, um, really global survey, which was uh, responded by 150 telecoms operators, and it was all around edge computing. So as some of you may know, we've been running an ongoing you know, research uh, program around edge computing. We have our edge computing practice that Yasmin mentioned. And some of the key questions in that survey were about how telcos are building edge compute, not just to support their, um, their core network, their RAN network, edge applications, but also private, their private cellular networks, which is one of the key topics for today. First thing to get going, so one of the key questions we had um, that we wanted to address in this webinar was around, you know, what is a private cellular network and an edge compute um, proposition? Why should the two go hand in hand? Um, for those who've joined some of our edge compute webinars in the past, you, you're probably aware of, you know, how we talk about the benefits of edge computing. But let's first take stock of you know, the benefits of private networks. Why does an enterprise want a private network? Lots of different things, you know, some of them are to do with uh, reducing total cost of ownership. It may be more cost effective to use a private LT or 5G network rather than, you know, use cable to connect a, an industrial setting, for example, or flexibility. Um, there's the ability to customize the network, to improve coverage. So clearly sectors like mining and oil and gas, which are uh, a lot of the time quite unconnected, can, uh, are able to digitalize. Uh, by using private networks. Uh, security, keeping data on site is a key consideration for manufacturers, for again, mining oil and gas companies. And in some cases, there's this interesting uh, benefit, which uh, is that having a uh, private network could be a, a revenue stream for enterprises if they're, if they're positioned as a neutral host. So we've seen examples of um, maybe shopping malls or retail parks where the owner of that, that, that uh, area wants to put in a, uh, I guess, equipment infrastructure to run maybe multiple private networks to support its tenants and its um, retailers. And the big one, of course, is low latency, which we talk about a lot. You can see that some of these benefits are um, complementary with edge computing because edge computing can further strengthen these. So um, the reason why some enterprises are looking at a private cellular network is to reduce latency for applications because you know, if you have a, uh, a low latency network like a 5G network, you're able to meet those sub, um, sub 50 millisecond uh, requirements that you need. And edge computing further enhances this because clearly as you host the application on site, that reduces the round trip distance and the round trip time as well. 
Um, so ultimately, then you get those ultra low latency, uh, uh, you can meet those ultra low, low latency requirements. And that's useful for, you know, multiple use cases, some of which we've covered in the past, um, and I'm sure the panel will talk about, but it's, you know, mission critical, IT and OT use cases, Internet of Things use cases in these industrial settings. Um, it could also be about using, you know, maybe augmented reality or immersive uh, applications in the retail setting. There's lots of these uh, applications that we're starting to see that will need that low latency benefit. On the other hand, there's, you know, there's, there's benefits that are not, um, that don't overlap between the two types of technologies on, you know, private networks, edge computing cannot solve your coverage needs. If you need to connect an environment, you really do need a private network and edge compute by itself is not sufficient. And customization here, we're talking about the ability to customize a network for a particular enterprise. That's something that's very specific to connectivity and, you know, based on the, the networking technology they use and it's somewhat removed from whether or not you use edge computing. On the flip side, edge computing bring, brings benefits. There's the ability to scale um, compute up and down. Um, if you have a kind of cloud native edge compute platform or distributed cloud platform, um, it, it allows for mobility. The challenge with a private network is it's often dedicated to the customer premises. If you're able to host an application at the network edge, then the application can move with the end user. Um, other great benefit of edge computing is actually reducing the amount of bandwidth that's required to so by uh, filtering some data or um, avoiding the need to move all that data to the cloud um, by using an edge compute you can reduce the cost as an enterprise customer there's lots of benefits that's you know that, that's the proposition it's, it's interesting for the enterprise for, for these reasons the thing is though for a telecoms operator as you're thinking about well how do you bring that solution to market how do you think through these things um, we've talked a lot in the industry about use cases, but there needs to be a more granular um, evaluation of use cases, partly because you have two different types of edges. So here we're just showing where, you know, the, I guess the different types of technologies uh, available that can support these applications. You have, you know, you could be using on-prem and on-prem edge compute at the customer site without a private network, that's the bottom layer. Then you can augment that with a private cellular network. And then the third kind of layer is using a network edge. So this is edge compute at telco data centers, mini data centers. And this is just one example, but you know, we've had a look, for example, in retail as a sector and try to look at, uh, try to evaluate use cases, not just based on what the use case is, but it's maturity. When is it gonna mature? Is it something that's happening today versus a longer term use case? And also, you know, which of these technologies it requires. And there are some, you know, not all use cases are the same. If you take, you know, things like um, autonomous fleet vehicles, being able to connect um, trucks for on the retail logistics side, that's going to take some time to uh, to have the, you know, the regulation there and the technology there that it's reliable enough. So it's a longer term use case. And it's an example of one that really would need a, a network edge because, you know, you can't simply rely on the application being hosted at a particular site. Um, on the flip side, you know, you've got some shorter term use cases that are starting to use an on-prem edge already. Some of them are around, you know, building management systems, monitoring energy usage, that kind of thing. You want to use edge because it, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to process that data on site, reduce the amount of data going to the cloud, increase reliability, etc. This is one example. In terms of what, you know, what should telecoms operators do about private networks and edge and how to get ready? There's two main things we've been looking at quite a little bit. First is how do you build a, a solution or a service? What are the components needed? What partners do you need to enable that? And the second thing is how do you take it to market? Because a lot of these, the applications we showed are not, are not all horizontal uh, IT services. And they do require some sort of know-how. Um, understand the customer's needs, the business requirements. Also, there is a more complicated ecosystem um, which requires telecoms operators to engage with the right partners, understand the competitive ecosystem, et cetera. On the first point, we're seeing a few different options for how to, to build a private cellular and edge solution. Uh, in some cases, you have scenarios or examples where it's really a, you know, a private cellular solution with some edge compute. Um, but it's quite a the edge compute part is quite minor. So really, the you know the stack or the solution is geared to support those network functions that will be uh, that will enable a private network, and there might be some spare edge compute capacity which co could host a handful of applications. And this is likely to be a, a more closed environment as well, where you know the applications would need to be vetted by that private cellular solution vendor. 
second, you know, uh, example is a combined solution. So we're seeing, you know, some interesting innovations around having a single piece of infrastructure that supports both private cellular networks and edge applications in a more uh, open way. And so there might be some some type of, I guess, edge car platform that allows the enterprise to onboard and offboard different types of applications, uh, which are all, you know, able to do so because they they uh, rest on cloud native uh, infrastructure. And then the last scenario we've seen based on some conversations with enterprises is you might have one where you know you have a um, the private network solution in a you know in, in a box and then separately that's being connected to an edge compute but the edge compute is maybe in a in the enterprise data center on site so it's a slightly different model to the combined solution we have a single infrastructure which is more of a you know, kind of edge in a box or a, a mini edge uh, um, type infrastructure play. Second thing is, you know, who do you work with to support, um, to create that, that the, the solutions as the different models. Um, I wanted to bring in some of the data from the hyperscaler or the, the edge server I've mentioned at the beginning. One of the questions we, you know, we wanted to understand is the role of the hyperscalers as a potential partner for creating those edge solutions. Then obviously not the only one, but it's a, you know, it's an interesting topic in the industry about how these hyperscaler partnerships are evolving and to what extent they are about using hyperscale infrastructure for edge applications versus using them for kind of network functions, um, open RAN, other models. The main, so what this is, what this chart shows here, um, this is, you know, based on the uh, results of the survey. What we wanted to look at is, you know, what, what's the difference what, what are telcos saying in terms of their appetite to engage hyperscalers um, at different types for different types of edge compute infrastructure domains so here on the orange we've got um, to use to engage hyperscalers to host applications edge applications at the network edge so these would be third-party applications enterprise applications the slightly lighter orange is um, about engaging hyperscalers for you know, for infrastructure and other uh, tools to enable applications for on-prem edge so at the customer premises. And then the last one is, the last kind of edge domain is private cellular networks. So this would be, again, engaging hyperscalers to enable private cellular network solutions. What, you know, what, what we can see is that telcos are most interested in working with hyperscalers for the network edge, for, you know, enabling applications on the network edge. You've seen some, you know, lots of announcements of partnerships, for example, with AWS, for, you know, with a telco working with AWS to enable a wavelength, AWS wavelength um, service, or, you know, Azure, Google, doing similar things as well. So those are, and those tend to be the more advanced ones. Um, there's a little bit less appetite, at, the, at least at the moment, on uh, private networks and, and the on-prem edge. Um, and that's partly maybe because it's, um, to some degree, there's, other, there's many other partners who are really looking to uh, work with telcos uh, in those two domains, and it's a much more open market. Second, second, I guess, dimension is why, you know, why did, why are those partnerships interesting? And we, we looked at, you know, um, whether the telcos are interested in looking at those hyperscaler partnerships for infrastructure. So taking their stack, their, their edge compute uh, platforms, whether it's more about the software platforms. So the fact that the hyperscalers have, you know, quite advanced cloud tools, now distributed cloud tools that will, that are, you know, adopted by many developers. Um, and, and you know they have a lot of skills as well around AI and machine learning, et cetera, which are also useful for these use cases that will be enabled by private networks and, and edge. And then the other two domains are more about, you know, um, I guess the partnership model, so whether there's some interest in going to market together and whether there's uh, they, the telco C value in working with the hyperscalers to help them deliver and implement the, the service. And that's where there's, there are some differences. So definitely there's, you know, there's a lot of interest in the partnerships for infrastructure and for software platforms. A little bit less so, I think what these re results imply is that the telecoms operators see less of a role for the hyperscaler in doing the delivery and the implementation. And it might be that either the telco will take that on or um, an alternative partner will do more of that. And that's something that'll be interesting to hear from the panelists about later on. The other thing is that there's a very open ecosystem uh, when it comes to private cellular networks and edge, um, and it's not just the traditional telecom you know, ecosystem we're talking about. Sure, you have mobile network operators who clearly have a right to play and are developing private cellular solutions. But what's happening is that because in certain markets you have spectrum now available for enterprises or other vendors to, uh, you know, to acquire, 
it's opened up that market. And so um, we're seeing uh, other kind of other players in the telecoms industry take a take a role and go direct to enterprises, whether it's network equipment providers or um, tower companies. I think there's a, you know some examples in the US with CBRS spectrum. Um, fixed network operators and cable companies as well. It's a much more open space. It's not. It's not just the mobile operators. And equally, you know, if you get closer to the industry, you have industry specialists. So in some cases, you have kind of other network providers, but uh, but they special. They might specialize in a technology. I guess like like Boingo in Wi-Fi, for example. Looking at private networks is an interesting opportunity for them. Or um, or yeah, basically, you know, other kind of horizontal IT managed service providers. And then lastly, you've got the um, the vertical industry itself. In you know, very few cases we've seen the enterprises themselves want to acquire the spectrum and maybe build and manage their network if if connectivity is, is critical. In more cases, they are they might acquire the spectrum, but they're looking for someone to support them in operating and building that network. And that could be you know any of these three players um, that we've already talked about, but it could also be like an industry SI systems integrator who might. Uh, take on that role and bring the end-to-end -end solution with the applications and the systems integration as well. So then what you know what does that mean from for a say like a, a, a communication service provider, a telco in there in terms of a go-to market? Um, well really there's you know there's a few models that we're seeing. Um, there's the first of all there's there's a kind of a path for traditional maybe mobile network operators or, or CSPs where they will lead the engagement and they will work likely with a partner network equipment provider to acquire the actual equipment some of the network functions they'll probably likely do the operations in the service wrapper and then they'll you know engage the end customer as well you also have a you know another pathway the second one where you might have um, a non-traditional csp uh, providing doing a similar role but it's just that you know their their nature is different so we've seen that there are specialists who provide private uh, who might have been providing private LT networks to airports, for example, for a long time. That's been an existing market, um, and also mining, oil and gas. Who you know, who've been looking at um, the opportunity to, to use cellular networks for a while because of the coverage issue. So they will, you know, they will continue to expand, and they'll look at new industries to expand into. And then the last two you have here are, um, you know, I guess scenarios where the telecoms operator is less involved partner-led pathway. So here we're saying, you know, someone that we would cast as a vendor in the industry, potentially uh, leading that and going direct to market and, you know, taking their, their solution uh, and uh, working with the end customer directly. And the end customer in that case would need to have, uh, need to acquire Spectrum. And then the last one you have is um, just, you know, a non-network vendor essentially taking on that role. And I mentioned systems integrators having a role here. They could be industry specialists, or they might be more like a managed service provider, IT managed service provider, uh, taking on the role of providing that, that private cellular network. So lots of different things, and there's lots of different pathways. And this is important because as a telco, the, uh, the competitive ecosystem is more complicated than it has been in the past. So just to wrap up, um, I guess a couple of key takeaways. One is that you know there's, there is demand for uh, a combination of edge with private cellular networks. We've seen why it's partly because the two are very complementary; they meet similar needs. You can also have some synergies around the solution itself and the infrastructure stack, leveraging the same in some cases. And the third thing, which I haven't been able to talk about in as much detail in the presentation, is that um, we're all talking about building an ecosystem because to enable both of these, you need to have an application ecosystem that will use the network and use the edge compute infrastructure as well. And so it makes sense um, to sort of build economies of scale by creating an ecosystem that targets both technologies. Second thing, you know, just talked about it, markets very open, there's lots of different players. And this means that your approach to partnerships uh, what might be more complicated than it has been in the past, and there's likely to be a lot of co-opetition where, you know, in some cases, for example, you might have a, a systems integrator who's your who's your customer in some scenarios, or is a channel, and in other scenarios, you're competing with them. So that level of co-opetition. And then last thing is, you know, you know, as we're seeing with 5G generally, partnerships are going to be key to enabling this. You need to bring different parts of the value chain together. Hyperscalers are one potential partner; they're not the only one. Um, but even within hyperscalers, you know, there's there's still uh, differences in terms of the perceived role of them being a partner 
um, in say the private cellular domain compared to the edge domain. And so that will be a consideration when telcos create a partnership strategy, who does it make sense to partner with, who will you know, optimize, I guess, or, or build a compelling solution, uh, but also um, uh, you know, be able to target multiple use cases and, and uh, provide, enable these different technologies as well. Just to end on, um, I just wanted to bring up a poll. So we'll go into the panel next, um, but I'm just curious to hear from the audience around uh, your views of private cellular and edge use cases and which sectors you're seeing most interest. So we have, you know, we've named four sectors here, energy and extractors, which is things like oil and gas mining. We've also got uh, healthcare as another example, um, could be in hospitals, it could be even potentially a national private uh, selling network uh, to to accommodate for remote uh, health monitoring, manufacturing. Uh, we've seen a lot of you know POCs happening in manufacturing, different types, whether it's discrete or automotive manufacturing, and then transport logistics as well. And then there's always others. You know, I talked about retail as an example that would be in the other bracket. Um, there's many others as well, uh, the energy sector, um, etc. So uh, we'll just wait. Um, another few seconds uh, to come in. It seems like there's, it's quite clear that there's a winner, but I'll wait and see if uh, any last minute responses change that. Okay. So I think, yeah, what the results show is that we've got, it looks like, you know, there's uh, some consensus that manufacturing is the biggest sector. It'll be interesting to see what the panelists think, if they agree or disagree and what they're doing to serve the manufacturing sector. And as I mentioned, energy and extractive. So the idea of bringing a private cellular solution to mining, oil and gas, it's it started, it's probably one of the earlier sectors and we'll continue to see that. Um, little bit less so in in healthcare um and that's you know that's uh, not too surprising given sometimes not the the fastest moving industry but on that note i will hand over to my esteemed colleague yasmin who will kick off the panel so thanks very much everyone and uh looking forward to watching the panel great thanks so much dahlia i hope everyone found it insightful um as dahlia mentioned we're now going to move to the panel part of the session um, just a reminder to those who have questions for our panelists today, please enter them in the questions box and we'll aim to get through as many as possible in today's session. Um, and for the ones we don't get to, we will include them in a Q&A write-up that we send afterwards. So please keep them coming. Now, uh, we are really excited as we have some great individuals here today for our panel session. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. Um, first up, we have Timo Yokiaho from Red Hat. Timo, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, so my name is Timo Yokiaho. I'm a chief technologist at the Red Hat Global Team in Ecosystem Team, which would be quite appropriate for this panel. I'm uh, based in Finland, have been at Red Hat for seven plus years. Great. Uh, next up, we have Philip Coleman from AT&T. Yeah, thank you. Philip Coleman, AT&T, so product marketing and development. So my uh, scope of my work spans 5G edge computing and uh, private cellular networks as well. I've been with AT&T for about 20 years and I'm based in Dallas. Thank you. And next, we have Andres Escribano from Telefonica Tech. Hi, my name is Andres Escribano. I am the director responsible for the Industria 4.0 business and, and new business around the Internet of Things and with data, where it included all of these kind of technologies like in our framework. Great. And last but not least, we have Naren Matia from Cox. Hello, everyone. I'm Naren Matia at uh, Cox Edge, which is a new business unit uh, within the new growth in. Uh, New, new growth and development uh, team within uh, Cox Communications, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, kind of head our strategy and business design efforts. Great. Thanks, everyone. So uh, let's get right in. Um, I'd like to start with you, Philip. Um, you know, given obviously within um, the telecoms industry, there's a lot of interest right now in edge computing and private cellular, and as well from enterprise customers, but what I want to dive a little bit more into is what do you see as the relationship and interplay between private cellular and edge computing? 
do you see one sort of as a catalyst for the adoption of the other or um, you know share some thoughts about that yeah thanks for that question I'll say uh, private cellular and door and you know edge computing are very very hot right now so they definitely open some doors and there's a lot of education going on between you know uh, kind of the the industry and uh, and private business as well um, in the end um, when I look at private cellular I think there is a role for connectivity as a use case and you sort of showed that on some of your initial slides about some of those benefits but ultimately customers are looking for solutions um, and I think that requires us to look you know more end-to-end -end from the the endpoint device through the the network infrastructure you know all the way to where that hosting uh, that application uh, and those outcomes so ultimately that, that's why you're seeing a lot of these partnerships um, you know in the in the news you know these days because we're we're trying to respond to the market and and another thing is when you want tight work when you want to have more of those uh, I guess uh, uh, applications or solutions with with higher more intense requirements that are more dynamic you're gonna have to have better orchestration between your uh, various layers and so ultimately getting to that model where you kind of have a combination of the, the the private cellular and the edge computing that that's kind of the holy grail to be able to tackle some of those uh, extreme uh, use cases and Andres are you seeing customers um, you know embrace that as two sort of very interrelated uh, technologies if you will uh, yeah, I think yes I think like I fully explained before I think the, the use case is the, the, the key driver for this kind of let's say of application of the technologies uh, if you see this kind of proposal at the end, it's a framework technology framework that solves many of the problems of the customers in, in the real world. Uh, today we have experience with uh, several verticals that are very, very active to adapt this kind of technologies in his business, in business needs. Like uh, you mentioned in the in the, in the poll, like uh, industrial manufacturing uh, force and airports. Mining companies are, are one of the leaders for this kind of adoption. That is something completely, let's say, amazing. Uh, uh, oil and gas, um, healthcare, they are starting to see that there are many use cases that is possible to be integrated in this use case, combining at the end technology and real customer needs. I think it's, it's one of the more active uh, area where the companies are following for the own digital transformation. Mm. And it's interesting because what I'd like to get a sense of and your thoughts on, and Nara, maybe I'll start with you, is how do you think the private cellular and edge computing opportunity for telcos has progressed in the last 12 months? Are you seeing more of an acceleration of interest in this area or has it sort of steadily been growing over time? Sure. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so actually, I mean, with private networks, you know, we, we see private networks as a catalyst for edge computing, right? Um, edge computing doesn't really need private networks to 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 exist, but it, it's it's just a different form of like network access, and the the private networks really accelerates the pervasiveness in terms of the access, um, you know, which is what really driving the need for that. But from an edge computing standpoint, there's been a lot of like you know tactical use cases uh, as well as like a lot of like POCs over the course of the last 12 months, and similar thing has been happening on the private network side of things as well. Within Cox Edge, we have a separate group that's actually focused on private networks, and they're working on a lot of specific use cases as well. But I think over the course of the next 12 months, you're going to see this acceleration of the coming together of private networks and, and you know, edge computing, because you know the real driver for private networks is to be able to you know process some of that data closer to where that data is being generated, right? And so you're going to see this natural uh, you know kind of say a marriage you know between private networks and edge computing um, you know in, in probably in the next 12 months. Mm, that's really interesting. And I guess I actually before we move on, I want to revisit the poll just to get some of your thoughts. Um, maybe I think. Jake or someone, if you could share the pop of the poll again. So we we've had a few comments in the um, uh, I guess in the in the questions around you know different industries and I know Andres you mentioned that a little bit. Um, I want to get you know your thoughts on or the panelists thoughts on whether the results are they a surprise to you? Um, you know are there any other industries that you would add to this? Or what have you seen sort of the change in that interest 
um, you know, in the last, you know, 12, 12 to 18 months. So maybe I chime in, yes, I mean it's okay. And so mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think the manufacturing is a surprise at all. I was <clears throat> completely expecting manufacturing to be you know top of the list, but I was a bit surprised uh, about healthcare. I was I was kind of uh, assuming healthcare would be higher on the list. It was now 30, if I remember right, because we have seen a lot of uh, activity on on healthcare, uh, even combining edge and uh, and private networks on healthcare. But manufacturing was expected. Healthcare a bit, bit of a surprise. Mm. And Timo, are what are some of the key drivers that you're seeing, and do those differ between, you know, for manufacturing customers versus for certain healthcare customers? Uh, I think you no. Know, from our point of view, which of course we are a little bit different company than than the rest of the panelists, but uh, from our point of view, uh, we don't see too much differences. But what we are a little bit um, not afraid, maybe not nervous, but uh, what we are looking is that, uh, or what we are driving maybe is to have more consistent uh, kind of deployment and uh, environment for both uh, the private network and edge and everything, so that you you would have this uh, better possibility to move your applications from location to location uh, along the lines of what Philip was saying, like automated way and management way, but you need to have more consistent environment for these things but but uh, the small fear is that uh, it's going to be too fragmented or maybe it is too fragmented right now but uh, it should not be fragmented and, and industry needs to work on that and given this fragmentation i'd like to maybe um fill it back to you ask about i guess what you see as what types of roles do you think CSPs can play within the private, um, you know, cellular and edge space? Um, as we mentioned, is it more of sort of the uh, ecosystem aggregator role, or is it participating in others' ecosystems, or what sort of that um, thinking process there? Yeah, that, that's fair. And um, just to just to kind of tell me what you say, CSP, you mean communication service provider? Yeah. Okay, thank you, because sometimes I put cloud there and I just want to be clear. Um, when I look at what it, so first of all, you know, the cellular industry has taken a huge uh, sort of a transition over the past 10 years from being very connectivity focused and rate plans at scale, very consumer like, to now being more enterprise focused. And when you look at an enterprise that has sort of incumbent infrastructure, uh, ongoing operations, and you want to bring in those new technologies, the entire uh, engagement process changes. It's not only the technology, the hats that you can wear you know, from a cloud provider, you know, what partners you would bring in, but it's also the how. Uh, so I think there's opportunities for CSPs to, to sort of take on that in different ways. The CSP can sort of stick to their strengths, um, which is connectivity and you know, sort of the knowledge of operating and deploying these networks and then build an ecosystem around that uh, with you know, cloud partnerships, with system integrators who can fill those gaps. Because ultimately the customers are all going to have different levels of um, you know resources uh, understanding and I think it needs to be more of a team effort to go from kind of that initial uh, fact-finding meeting all the way to a close and other CSPs with uh, additional capabilities or appetite might wear more hats but I think that's kind of the beauty of it is is you're not going to see the one-size-fits-all uh, model going forward globally I think it's really going to depend on what region you're in uh, what the market's demanding and then you know what's the most efficient mm -hmm. and andres actually back back to you what has been sort of that journey for telefonica tech as you mentioned you're doing a lot of work and are very focused in sort of the industry 4.0 side how is that sort of transition into focusing a lot more been for you i i think uh, as mentioned philip i think one of the more important thing is is the yeah, having the transition to build the real use case. In general, the customer needs something that solves the end-to-end view. Not only we implement technology like that, it's necessary to integrate many different components. Uh, if we're thinking in the main component, more important components, we're talking about the device, the architecture for the communication that you need to deploy, private network, 5G, the protocol that you need to, to be deployed. 
the platform that is able to gather in the information coming from, from hundreds of devices that is sending information in the factory itself, and obviously the integration of the artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., etc., to really put value in this kind of things. Uh, for us, the, the, the journey is how is integrated all these pieces to guarantee that you are able to offer an end to end in, a, in general and in industrial. Uh, with industrial uh, demands of the service level agreement or the high demanded uh, capabilities that these companies need need to solve, you know, because it's a very demanding area. And how it's integrated all this stuff uh, is, is something that is the journey. At the end, build a different solution. There are different use cases that is more important than other ones, but in general, it's an end-to-end view. -end yeah, and I'll jump in quickly, but Andres, just to close out my previous thought, pre previous thought too is. One thing that we found is very important is, is we, we've had a, a consulting practice within the company for, for decades, and, and now that team is, is sort of a center focus in um, being kind of that tip of the spear, you know, with customers. So yeah, to, to be able to look end to end requires kind of the traditional functional groups or roles within a, a CSP uh, to have to be able to go beyond, and sometimes you can have a, a, that consulting arm kind of be that overlay. So a lot of opportunity. And that's actually really interesting as well, given that, as you mentioned, because the space is is quite nascent, there is still um, a significant amount of education that needs to happen also from a customer point of view. You know, I guess this question of, you know, how do we define a private cellular network again is, um, you know, has been seeing some confusion here and there. Or, you know, if we talk about, let's say, private 5G, you know, there's even this difference between let's say, you know, what is 5G, uh, public versus private, et cetera. And I guess, go ahead. Oh, yeah, there's, and then there's the question of good enough, you know. Um, I think we we love the technology and the extreme low latency and, you know, all the, the things that come with that. But I think as we engage customers and you look at healthcare, you look at manufacturing, you look at the industrial sector, um, what are their requirements and how does that map? And, you know, that's why there's so much focus on the infrastructure layer, whether, uh, um, you know, because you want to build in the right flexibility and build the right foundation, have the right products and capabilities there, and then be able to go where the customer needs to go and have the right options, because ultimately it's going to be a, a cost performance or some sort of trade-off, um, and you, you do need to understand where you fit uh, and what's optimal. Mm. And just to add to that, right? I mean, when you when you kind of think about it, edge and, and how it exists, I mean, it's going to have to coexist and, and be complementary to the centralized cloud, right? And and you're, it's, it naturally there's going to be certain workloads that are going to evolve to the edge, and they would have to work in conjunction with um, you know certain workloads that would need to be processed at the centralized cloud. And, and a lot of it is going to really vary depending on the vertical or the use case in terms of how you architect that and. Uh, so from a Cox edge, um, you know, we view that, you know, you really need to kind of serve the customer and, you know, keeping it open and cloud agnostic is really the way that you know, you're going to have this distributed environment work for the customer. And so it's it's interesting because, again, as you read and, and study each of the verticals, uh, the blueprint that kind of comes out of that is going to actually look different between, uh, you know, all these different, uh, you know, use cases. So, but it's it's definitely a journey and, and, and we're, Kind of collectively learning this you know with the customer as we engage with them mm -hmm. and timo i mean one of the things that was quite interesting that came out of some of our research is the fact that today um you know enterprises still deploying edge and or private cellular as as point solutions um and you know there's also you know who which stakeholder are you engaging with within the enterprise right because it's often not as aligned as um as some might think but given the space is still nascent and you know people are talking about oh well what are the killer use cases how important is the concept of ecosystems and Maybe if you talk a little bit about, I guess, the, what Red Hat is doing um, to address some of this. Yeah, so that, <clears throat> that's a great question. And, and I would like to start answering by, by quoting some people who always who say constantly that <clears throat> telco industry is boring. But look, here we are talking about ecosystem and, and partnerships and, uh, <laughs> and multi-vendor integration and and, and bringing in ideas how to 
bring more value to the to the telecom networks and telco operators uh, including edge and cellular so i don't think this is boring i think this is uh, this is fascinating and and why this is why this all is happening is of course obvious all these disaggregation efforts in the telco industry in the core network and going to open ran and then uh, onboarding whatever edge application on open run deployment and all these things so this whole thing is uh, is uh, a big partnership play with uh, you know and a big telco ecosystem on all the levels all the levels hardware platforms applications management automation system integration equipment providers telcos everybody so I don't think uh, going forward we can do anything without uh, ecosystem and and strong partnership between between all of us. So not boring at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I guess um, one of the one of the questions that we've actually got from the audience is a question about um, and this is with regards to private cellular and edge sort of separately. So the, the first one, and I'd like to direct this to, to Andres, is what? how does private cellular compare to other more, I guess, technology, uh, connectivity technologies that enterprises are more familiar with? For example, you know, Wi-Fi and industrial Ethernet. The, the, fair, the fair question is, is related with compared technology and use case. I think both technologies combine in different use case, but for other ones, you need to answer or you need to think if they are mission critical or not. And there are several aspects that in the architecture is necessary to take care of. For example, spectrum and how it's possible to guarantee the, the service level agreement. For example, Wi-Fi is quite complex to maintain this kind of security issues uh, in traditional approach. The second is, is the capillarity that this technology offer in the, in the current uh, ecosystem of device, you know. 5G is something that is, uh, there are plenty of manufacturers working in an open standard. It's not used only for industrial, it's used for many other use cases. And, and the third one is, is and, and I think it's more important for me, is uh, thinking in the obsolescence side of the technology. Really, this kind of technology has evolved for three, five years, but this kind of technology, that like a 5G, probably we are uh, working uh, because we need to support that in the public way for decades. And when you are making investment in this kind of private uh, technologies, probably you are able to guarantee that your factory is able to work during several years with no change in the technology and you are able to guarantee the, the support of the open standard implementing this kind of technology. I think there are a lot of little technical things, but if we try to summarize in a two or three important points, I, I think it's the more important one, you know, at least from my point of view. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is the, that is one of the most popular questions that, that we get from our, our customers. And you're right, you almost need to have a, a conversation. It's it's kind of hard to just break it down into sound bites, but I can think of a couple to, to add to, to what you said, Andres. One is gonna be just range. Uh, you just have different power profiles uh, between one versus the other. And so cellular, private cellular, has sort of a, a special place in uh, outdoors as well, for indoor, outdoor, and maybe a cost efficiency there. Um, you have the opportunity to capture license spectrum uh, and integrate that into your private cellular networks as well, which gives a little bit more protection uh, from an inter interference perspective. Uh, and then the third one is just that uh, private cellular networks are, are more SIM-based, so they're inherently closed networks, which gives a certain layer of, uh, I'll call it security, I'll put it in air quotes, uh, whereas uh, Wi-Fi networks are easier to build open and from a roaming perspective. So the, the way I usually talk about it is that you need both. You need both Wi-Fi and you need cellular. Uh, it really depends on the the venue, the the traffic profile. Because if I'm going to a stadium and I I want you know my my hundred thousand fans to be able to to access, um, you know you can do that with a one size fits all network with Wi-Fi. Whereas the strategy to support all those uh, it gets a little bit more complicated with cellular. But again, big topic. I love talking about it. And there's no right answer as long as you're saying that they're both good and they both have sort of their different attributes exactly so this idea that you know there is no right or wrong they're complementary as opposed to you know a private cellular versus wi-fi type of scenario and ultimately at the end of the day as you say it, it really is around um where do you find the complementary spaces 
where do you find opportunities to, in a way, consolidate some of that fragmentation that customers are dealing with today? Um, and so moving moving to sort of the, um, the, the edge side of it, we've actually had a question from uh, Dahlia, but another Dahlia, actually. <laughs> Um, and Naren, I want to direct this to you, and this is actually um, related to what you mentioned before. Um, the question is, you know, in the past few years, we've seen enterprises focusing heavily on moving to the cloud. Um, are you seeing any sort of resistance in bringing some of those applications back to more of an on-premise based solution? Or, um, and what are some of the challenges or ways of overcoming that? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. So you're right, yes, enterprises have invested heavily in, in moving to the to the centralized cloud, right? But what, what enterprises are starting to see, especially in some of the conversations that we've had, is there are certain limitations in terms of, you know, just for example, like um, a lot of the enterprises where if, if it's data intensive applications, right, transporting all that data to a centralized cloud is too expensive and it's not efficient. And the time to inside for certain applications is, is more uh, apparently needs to be quicker. So I think what, again, so the edge would coexist with the cloud, with the centralized cloud, but I think it's really depending on, it would depend on the workloads and the applications that do need to get processed locally, as well as, um, you know, some of the cost efficiencies that, that you know, enterprises can gain by, um, you know, not needing to transport the data to, to, to a centralized cloud. So those are some of the, the examples, and that's again going to vary, um, you know, between between use cases. And the last thing that I want to add to that is, um, I mean, latency is obviously one one benefit of, of the edge, but there's also other benefits, such as, um, you know, there's a lot of use cases where there's this need from a governance perspective to keep data locally, um, uh, regionalization. So that's a, another driver. And then the um, you know the the autonomous aspect of it as well. So I think there you know outside of the latency, there's a few other benefits of you know needing to keep the data local. Mm. And what are you seeing as some of the key challenges that enterprise customers face in a sort of the exploration of private cellular and edge, and then sort of in the later stages also scaling existing deployments. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think even to the previous question, right, there's there's this uh, trying to understand how that migration is going to happen from the centralized cloud to the edge and trying to make that um, as less complicated as possible in terms of migrating some of the workloads. And because, you know, and this is not just with the enterprise, right, but also when you kind of think about the developer community that wants to build applications, um, you need to be able to be open to that from an edge perspective and, and you know, enable the developers to have the right platforms and tools to, you know, to create applications more from a distributed cloud perspective versus the, the centralized cloud. Um, and then from an enterprise perspective, I think, you know, going back to, um, you know, it really boils down to which applications does make sense to move to the, uh, to the edge, right? So it's, it's a business driver that there needs to be analyzed on a case by case basis before determining that you know everything needs to move to the edge or kind of you know keep existing systems in the cloud as is so it's really um you know and, and the way enterprises are doing that are by working with existing partners to determine what's that right approach what's that right architecture in terms of looking at their existing um you know cloud infrastructure hmm. and do you see in a way um sort of this resurging interest in applications interfacing much more with networks. I mean, you know, the, obviously with edge computing, it is a, a classic sort of a manifestation of that to bring more of that network intelligence or insights to the way that you, for example, provide that latency. Are you seeing that from a de application developer point of view? Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, from, from, from a Cox perspective, right, um, you know, we, we've kind of, we're, we're trying to, you know, bring the right tools in place for, you know, attracting developers to to build that, you know, distributed uh, cloud applications, right? Whether it's PaaS, IaaS, CAS, um, uh, the right sets of SDKs or APIs. I mean, making sure those are available to kind of enable the developers is going to be key in this next evolution of like, you know, edge centric applications versus, um, you know kind of moving certain workloads from a cloud native application to the edge. Mm. 
That, that's really interesting, and I and and I'm you know excited to see how this uh, this space will evolve. You know, in the in the next you know twelve to eighteen months as well. Um, and right, I mean, I want to go back to Andres. So, what are some of I guess the key sort of priorities that you're seeing um, in terms of how you're driving um, you know private selling and edge with your customers? I think it's, it's uh, two things. One is uh, integrating the, a solution that is able to be delivered in a very easy way the different application or use case that we need to cover. And second, uh, integrate this kind of application that really help the, comp the companies in this uh, transformation. And it's included uh, the two components that we mentioned before, the 5G or the private networks components and the edge computing that analyze all this data specifically on-prem, because the private network and on-prem is something that is very uh, related. The idea is, is deploy uh, an infrastructure that is able to deploy virtual network function and capabilities con to computing function in the same space, and able to optimize this transfer of data to be efficient when we transfer, we will not, when I work in a different use case. Uh, imagine something that is, for example, talking about remote operation or something like that. If we are able to combine it, uh, the processing of the video in the same place where that is connected, the information you are able to offer a complete different per perception and quality for the different service. And this is our priority, how is combining in the same space computing capabilities and communication capabilities and be able to deploy in a very easy way, not on a very complex environment, in a very easy, uh, simple environment that guarantee that we are able to reach a whole type of customer or whole, whole kind of customer. Mm. And from I, I, another question that we've got from the audience from Joseph, uh, Joseph there's a question around, um, you know, whether it's for larger uh, enterprise companies or, you know, smaller or medium businesses, is there a demand in having, um, you know, fully managed services, for example, for let's say um, certain types of applications or you know edge applications that they're deploying? Um, Philip, I don't know what what you're seeing from your customers. Yeah, I think it's very, I think it's very uh, thoughtful to have a, a managed services capability. Um, and if you just think about it, and I don't know if if, if I got turned over this. Uh, this very highly capable network, um, and and the and the operator or my integrator kind of walked away. Uh, there may be some uh, some ramp up time. So I think having that bridge from you know install to uh, getting that first use case, that second use case onboarded, even extending out to kind of a full managed service where you know monitoring KPIs and um, you know uh, configurations and so forth over time. That is something that we are hearing that there is an interest in. And um, and I, I think especially for again firms that don't have the the, the resources or the skill sets or the appetite to operate the network, I think that there'll always be a, an opportunity. And do you see just that sort of? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Just to add to that. Um, so I mean, as as enterprises are looking to deploy more microservices and containers, right? We're starting to see like managed Kubernetes as a a clear area where um you know of, of uh think a clear area of interest essentially from enterprises and uh there's new players that are coming into to providing that's a, that type of capability as well mm. and that's interesting do you see that need for uh, for example that managed services capability increasing as this market matures i mean i think it, it's it's really going to boil down to, um, you know, the ability to be agile and be able to deploy services quickly, and it's it's and and managed services is going to be a key, um, you know, capability to enable enterprises through that process, right? So uh, versus having to organically, um, you know, build the resources required to uh, do that uh, capability. So I think, um, you know, with with all these new Technology is evolving, right? I think managed services are going to be a key capability that uh, that we're going to see. Mm -hmm. So there's another question from Alan, um, and uh, so Naren, you mentioned that processing data where it's created and keeping sort of that data local is going to be um, one of the key drivers. 
Um, the question is, you know, what does the panel think about the impact on analytics and the need for that real-time insight? Um, and, you know, what kind of use cases or workloads are you seeing that demands some of that edge analytics and that real-time capability um, brought in? Hey, I can I can take that one. Um, if someone else has something to add to that, hey, some of the use cases we're seeing from an edge analytics is is really around you know IoT, um, you know with huge um, you know uh, deployments on IoT, we're seeing use cases um, in 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 different verticals essentially where edge analytics is is important because previously you know you would have an aggregator that's pushing all the data out to a centralized location where you're seeing a lot of the analytics happen and then push that insight back. So some of these real-time interaction type of applications require that edge analytics to be closer to the data. It doesn't have to be on-prem. It could be at a um, it, it could be at a, a metro edge or a network edge, but still having that you know from a latency perspective, having that analytics close is going to be important. Um, as well as I think um, analytics is is kind of interesting from a from a retail use case perspective. Um, you know. Um, especially around, um, you know, uh, looking at shoppers like demographics and being able to position, um, you know, kind of have that experience that shoppers need, and 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 that real-time analytics is going to drive some of that engagement with with the customer. Um, but retail is a good use case there, um, where you're seeing that that edge analytics is going to be important. Any thoughts on any thoughts to add to that, Phil? No, I, I second that. I, I say a, a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of a lot are starting with the infrastructure and they're experimenting with use cases on top. Whether it's you know video analytics, which has application in retail, manufacturing for safety, for dwell times, things like that, where you don't want that data always you know all going back to the cloud because it's a lot of video. Um, and even AR VR. I mean, we've seen some of our you know the the, the government defense areas looking at war 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 games and things like that. So. Again, a lot of experimentation that's trying to take advantage of the capabilities, but they are justifying and starting with the infrastructure um, first. So just aware we have a couple minutes left, I want to wrap up by just um, asking everyone, you know, what sort of your predictions are for when the private selling and edge market will start to mature um, and maybe some of your priorities as well in the next 12 months. Um, Andres, I'd like to start with you. Sure. I think uh, there are two combinations that I believe that in 22 and 23 there are, there are explode this kind of technologies and, and the reason is two things. One is the digital transformation of the company that are related with the digital product manufacturing means it's necessary to adapt the, the, the way to manufacturing the things and this kind of technologies like an edge computing is, is one of the key for this transformation and the second is all effect that we suffer with the COVID and pandemic that is, net, is accelerating this adoption. I mean, for me, uh, the next year is when the companies are preparing the, the, the infrastructure to make the digital transformation internally in the infrastructure and the 23 is when really we suffer the effect in a positive way for use this kind of technologies. Mm. And Timo, what are your thoughts on how this will play out in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? So, so I think I think the progress is quite rapid as we speak, and uh, and to to say that this is mature, I don't think that's going to take uh, a very long time. Maybe 12 months, maybe even less. And again, uh, from Red Hat point of view, everybody knows that we are an open source company. We don't have applications. We don't have edge applications. We don't have any applications. We are open source plat platform company, and we provide uh, also automation tools and API management tools and, and all those things. So we are an enabler in this e ecosystem. and. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting place to be, obviously, but it's also a challenging place to be because we need to run all the time because our platforms need to be able to host any of the applications you guys invent, whatever those might be, and we just need to have capabilities to do that. And so it's an ongoing process, but uh, the pace is uh, very fast at this point. Mm -hmm. And then over to you, Philip. Yeah, I, I think it's less of a technology problem, just in the private cellular space. You know, the infrastructure is there. I think it's more of a figuring out the business model, uh, getting those 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 case studies, getting those first solutions, 
because I think then it becomes more repeatable. And I think there's a lot of uh, folks that are watching very closely to see to see what what what's going on in their space, uh, and they'll jump in. So I, I like the 12 month uh, window as well. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Naren, what about what's uh, what are your focus areas next for um, especially for Cox Edge as well? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, just to just to add to that, right? I think we're kind of migrating from this uh, experimentation POC type of um, you know time frame over the course of the last I would say 12 to 18 months when since when midband spectrum opened up um, and the shared spectrum concept kind of took off, right? So now the next phase is really seeing which of those use cases are really the ones that are scalable, and uh, and you're going to see acceleration of those adoption of those uh, you know specific use cases because at the end of the day. Um, you know, there have to be clear business drivers that are driving this um, versus just, you know, experimentation, right? So uh, we're obviously in this phase of like working and understanding where are some of those scalable use cases where edge and private networks do coexist. But I do think that, you know, private network will definitely accelerate the adoption of edge um, because of the fact that, you know, it's the clear value drivers that, that exist from being able to process some of this information closer. So... Great. So I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists, Timo, Philip, Andres, and Darren for, for you know, participating and getting involved in this. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Red Hat, for supporting us in this webinar. Next month, we do actually have a senior CSP Executives Edge Strategy Workshop in Dubai on Monday, the 18th of October. So if you are interested in joining us there, please reach out to one of us for more information. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, we will be sharing the webinar recording and slides after to watch back and share with colleagues. We will also be following up with a Q&A document addressing some of the other questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, so there, if there are any questions that do come to mind, please feel free to send them our way. Um, but thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and see you soon.